Good evening, everyone. It sure is good to have everyone here tonight. We're thankful that you're here. Got some visitors tonight. We're thankful that you're here as well. We would encourage you to fill out a visitor's card and pass it down to the end of the aisle, and we'll have a record of your visit. It's just great to be here. Uh, cool weather outside. It feels like fall, but it's not quite too cold yet, unless you're really cold natured, and then we'll just have to give you a warm hug when you get here. I do have some announcements I'd like to share with you. We'll start with our prayer list. Uh, the updates we had this morning, uh, Diane had good test results, and we're thankful for that. Uh, also, Susan Kendrick will be having an endoscopy on Tuesday, November 23rd, so please keep that in your prayers as well. We also added Jimmy Dodson to the prayer list. He's having back surgery on December 2nd, December 2nd, so keep Jimmy in your prayers. And we also added Gerald Lockwood. This is the, the father of a friend of David. So please keep Gerald Lockwood in your prayers as well. Other announcements, things going on in the congregation. Uh, Tuesday morning Bible class, 10 a.m. If you're able to be here for that, we'd encourage you to do so. There's also a sign-up sheet uh, for Christmas gifts for a 14-year-old foster care girl that we are trying to help out. So see Kelly if you have any information about that. We need those gifts to be unwrapped and have them to Kelly by the 28th of this month. Also, the Christmas parade is December 3rd. Be sure and uh, bring candy if you can for that. We're going to fill up a bag of candy and some literature and give those out. Make sure that everyone knows that there is an active congregation of the Lord's Church here in the faith. Also, don't forget on December 5th, uh, we'll have our fellowship meal and gift exchange after morning worship. And our evening worship will follow at 3 p.m. We'll have our door knocking uh, on the second Saturday, December 11th. Meet here at the building at 10 a.m. for that. And we encourage everyone, if you haven't done that, uh, come come do it. it. It's real easy. We uh, we go to specific places with addresses. And uh, it's, it's a good way, to, again, to let everybody know that we've got faithful Christians here in the Fed. There's also a sign-up sheet for the items that are needed to make up gift baskets that we'll be handing out. And uh, they'll be making those gift baskets baskets up on December 12th following evening worship. Uh, just as a reminder, the youth will lead that worship on December 5th, so be sure that you encourage them and do the right thing by being here uh, regardless. Ladies Paint Night, Friday, December 17th at 6 p.m. The cost for that is $30 for the materials, and uh, there's a sign-up sheet for that, and see Chloe if you have questions about that. So all the announcements I have at this time, it's the proper time. Dalton will be leading us in our opening prayer, and I will have a closing prayer. We'll turn the song service over to John. the first, second, and third verse of this one, and then we'll sing another song, and then we'll have prayer. First. Together, let's try it. Together, let's sing.
Our righteous and holy Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for another opportunity today to gather together in your name to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, we're thankful for these wonderful songs that we've sung today to teach and admonish one another with. And we pray, Father, that that has been done and that we can continue to be encouraged by these wonderful scriptural songs that we are singing together. And appreciate for Johnny and so many others that we are singing in this congregation. Father, we pray that as the song we've just sung suggested that we can count our many blessings. And as Brother Payton mentioned this morning, it is an innumerable amount as we think about how much you bless us daily. And Father, we pray that we'll not only be thankful this week and on Thursday, but year-round as we've been discussing today. And Father, we pray that gratitude in our hearts will motivate us to always put you first in our lives and that we'll truly do our reasonable service, that we'll be that living sacrifice that you would have us to be. We're thankful for this congregation, Father. We're thankful for our good elders. And as always, we want you to, to please grant them wisdom and the courage to continue to, to stay close and, and spot on the truth, Father, and, and keeping others that would hinder such uh, outside of, of this congregation and, and perhaps even in the future sometime, hopefully not, but within, Father, help them to have the wisdom to make sure that, that Satan is kept at bay and, and that we do not turn in a direction, Father, that you would not have us to, as so many of our fellow congregations have done. We're thankful for each of them and their good wives that support them. We're thankful for Brother Payton and his family and pray your continued blessings on them as they labor here with us. We pray for each member of this congregation. We pray that we'll all do our part, that every joint will supply, and that this congregation will continue to be edified, encouraged, and that we can be that example, that light in this community so that others will see the love of you and our hearts, Father, and our actions, and that they will know that we're Christians and want to come and be part of this wonderful body here as well. We pray for those who are unable to be here tonight that are homesick, those who have upcoming surgeries and other ailments that are in the way. We pray for each of them and that you'll meet their needs as you see fit. Father, for the positive results that, that we've heard so far, we're thankful for good news and we pray that will continue to be the case as others go in and, and are going through tests, Father, and surgeries and, and other activities, that their health will continue to be what they would want it to be, Father, and they can continue to worship with us. For those who have lost loved ones, we pray for your comfort to be with them, that we can be an encouragement to them as well. And for those who are spiritually sick, we especially pray, Father, that, that your word will be able to prick their heart as we know that, we, that it can, that we can encourage them to come back and and be faithful to you once more. Father, we're so thankful for your word. We pray that our hearts will never be never be hardened to it. We pray that we'll always be open to it, that it will prick our hearts and continue to, to keep us right and aligned as we are open-minded to it. We're thankful for, again, this time of worship. And we pray, Father, that we'll be able to focus our minds and hearts so that we can worship you truly in spirit, spirit and in truth this evening as well. In Jesus' name, amen.
great to be here as always it's so great to see everyone now couldn't think of a better place in all the world to be than right here with the good folks at the Lafayette Church of Christ and we are so very thankful that you are here with us tonight you know I, I, I guess you could say a very prominent teaching one of many that you and I see in the pages of our New Testament is about the second coming of Christ a couple of weeks ago, we did a study of the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, I believe it was, and through about verse 13 of that chapter, where we saw plainly that the day of the Lord is an event that is going to come. And the day of the Lord, as you and I see it in the pages of the New Testament, is talking specifically about the second coming of Christ. Now, there are a lot of different things that the Bible teaches us about the second coming of Christ. But if you remember, according to Peter's account there in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, Peter said specifically that the day of the Lord would come as a thief in the night. Do you remember that? What is Peter trying to stress to you and I when he describes the second coming of Christ as a thief in the night? It's an unexpected moment. A thief comes when you do not know that he is coming. It's a surprise. Likewise, if we were to take the time to go to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, there Paul would express or explain, explain the second coming of Christ in the same way as a thief in the night. And Paul does something a little different there. He adds, as travail comes upon a woman. That's talking about labor pains that a woman receives when she is about to go into labor. A woman does not know when that's going to happen. I mean, she just... She knows that the baby is coming. Uh, it's been predicted. <laughs> the forecast is there. But she does not know when those labor pains are going to hit her. A lot like with the second coming of Christ, we know that it's coming. It is a time that has been predicted in the New Testament over and over and over again. But we don't know exactly when that time is coming. It's like a thief in the night. Not everyone believes that. Even though the Bible plainly teaches that it's going to be as a thief in the night and as labor pains travail upon a woman, there are those who believe that there are signs and there are times that you and I can look to in this life. And because of those signs, then we can conclude that Jesus' coming must be soon. Someone might ask the question, well, where is it that they get this idea? They get it from Matthew chapter 24. And that's what I want us to do in our time together tonight. I want us to go to Matthew chapter 24, see what this chapter is not teaching, and see what this chapter is teaching. I want you to see, just as plain as the words are on the page of this chapter, that this book is not teaching, or this chapter is not teaching that there are certain signs that you and I can look at and say, okay, This is happening, and this is happening, and this is happening. Therefore, we can determine that Jesus' coming is going to be soon. You and I cannot do that. And and the place that many go to the passage, again, is Matthew chapter 24. Now, if you are taking notes, a parallel passage to this that would do you good in reading, or do any of us good in reading about the second coming of Christ, or what we are going to look at this, this evening, is Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 37. And in Luke chapter 21, you can read about this in a parallel setting. They're going to be just a little different. 
And when I was thinking about how I was going to present this, I started out with Mark and I went to Matthew. I like Matthew a little bit better, but we are going to ping pong back and forth between Matthew, Mark, and Luke in order to get the complete details of this, this particular chapter. Now, we are going to look at verses 1 of chapter 24 all the way through to verse 44. Now, I am not going to go into detail and explain all 44 verses, so please don't get up and run out. I know when we study Revelation, we get three, four, maybe five verses, and that's it in a 45-minute study. We're not going to do that in detail, but what I want you to do as we look at this chapter, we're just going to read through it, we're going to point out some details, and we're going to let the Bible tell us what is being talked about in this chapter. There are three breakdowns in this chapter that you and I are going to look at. We are going to look at verses 1 and 2. We're going to look at what caused, what is the setting of this particular teaching that you and I are going to find in this chapter. In verses 3, going through all the way through to verse 35, you have an answer to one question. And then beginning in verse 36, going through verse 44, you have the answer to a second question. I think uh, something that I think is very important that you and I understand as we look at this setting is to recognize exactly what Jesus is talking about. And when we have that understanding, then it helps us to better understand what the Bible is not teaching. Now let's begin first of all with the setting, if you will. And the setting is found in verses 1 and 2. Read it with me. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, why is it that Jesus presents these apostles or his apostles in this day with this particular teaching? Look at what they do. They come out of the temple. And what are they emphasizing? They are literally emphasizing the beauty of the temple. In fact, if you were to go over to Mark's account, you would see that Mark would talk about the beauty of the stones. In Mark's parallel passage, he would talk about the beauty of the stones and the beauty of the temple. My question is, what is the emphasis of the apostles here in this passage? It's how beautiful the temple is. In other words, their attitude or their thoughts of direction is headed in the wrong place. They are thinking about the physical. And Jesus, throughout His teaching, has tried to get them to focus in on the spiritual. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus lets them know that this physical temple, that's not what's important. Because what's going to happen to this physical temple? It's going to be destroyed. It's the spiritual temple that is most important in this life. And you can see that from the teaching of the Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 16, where he would say, Know you not that your body, your body is the temple of God. Interesting thing that that word temple is the same identical word temple that you can see right here in verses 1 and 2. What's the difference? This was a physical temple. This was a temporary temple. But the temple that Jesus is talking about or that Paul is talking about, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that's the temple, that's the place where God would meet man in the physical body. And so the attitude of the disciples was more so on the physical than on the spiritual. And so what Jesus does is He lets them know that this temple is going to be destroyed. And it was not just this temple that was going to be destroyed. When Jesus makes mention in verse 2, do you not see all of these things? I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. That was a direct reference to the destruction of Jerusalem, which was coming, which actually took place in the year of A.D. 70. And in the year of A.D. 70, not only was Jerusalem destroyed, that which people looked at and and they revered because of its beauty, but also the temple that they cherished and they treasured, it too was destroyed. So after Jesus tells His disciples this, look at verse 3. 
Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Note, if you will, that there are two questions that are asked by the disciples. Number one, when will these things be? What things do the disciples have in mind? The destruction of the temple and likewise the destruction of Jerusalem. The second question, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Now that seems like two questions. But brothers and sisters, you and I understand that when it comes to the second coming of Christ, what's going to happen to this world? What's going to happen to this age? It's going to end. That can be seen from the book of 2 Peter chapter 3 in verse 10 where Peter would say that the elements of the earth shall melt with fervent heat. The earth will be dissolved. It will be no more. And so when you and I think about the end of times and the second coming of Christ, that is going to happen in one moment. Jesus is going to come and everything that you and I know and understand today is going to be completely and utterly destroyed. So there are two questions that are being asked. When is Jerusalem going to be destroyed? When is the temple going to be destroyed? And when is it that you're coming back and everything is going to be ended? Now, Jesus is going to answer the very first question beginning in verse 4 and going all the way through to verse 35. How do I know that? Okay, look with me. In verse 6, in verse 6, as he is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, he says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. Watch what he says. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Okay, what things? All of the things that he's going to talk about. Now, the end has not yet come yet. Many people believe that that's talking about the second coming of Christ. But remember, if we keep it in the context, Jesus is discussing the destruction of Jerusalem. And Jesus is talking about the end of Jerusalem has not come yet. Now, with that thought in mind, drop down to verse 34. In verse 34, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, oh, don't miss this, this generation. Which generation? That one that was standing there. That one that was listening to every word that Jesus spoke. This generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Brothers and sisters, if you and I go into the context of Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 34, and we say that this is talking about the second coming of Christ, then what else must we conclude? It's already taken place, and it took place in the generation of these people. You see how that puts us back on track? Because you and I know that Jesus has not come yet. How do we know that? Because we're still here, and this world is still here. What's going to happen in this world? It's going to be destroyed. What does Paul say is going, say is going to happen to you and me? First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We've seen that from the teaching of the Bible when it comes to the second coming of Christ. And so that verse right there, those two verses just almost serve as bookends where he says twice, all of these things that I'm talking about, they are going to take place before Jerusalem and the temple are destroyed. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to read through and we're going to talk about these and we're going to talk about some of these things and try our very best to explain them and try to explain away the false doctrine that has been taken and shoved into these passages of Scripture. Now, beginning in verse 4, Jesus says, Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended 
will betray one another and will be hated and, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of lawlessness, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Now, what people who teach that these are signs of the second coming of Christ, what they do is they focus in on that one phrase, then the end will come. The question is, what end is Jesus talking about? Is He talking about the end of the world? Or is He talking about the end of Jerusalem? Because remember, there are two questions that are asked. When is the end going to come? When is Jerusalem going to be destroyed? When is the temple going to be destroyed? And also, when is the end of the world going to take place? Now, just think with me for a moment, logically. In this particular passage, he said that people are going to be deceived. How long has that been going on? <laughs> Since the beginning of time? You're going to hear of wars and rumors of war. How long has that been going on? Do you remember a time when there was not a war or a rumor of war. Just this afternoon when I turned my computer on to look over my notes for this lesson tonight, it had headlines. You know, there's a, a fear that Russia is going to go in and invade Ukraine. And, and I'm, I'm thinking, huh, how ironic that I see that. And then you're looking at this passage right here. Rumors of wars and wars. Again, when you think about trouble for all. I mean, how long have people experienced trouble? Nation rising against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. How long has that been happening? Go through the Old Testament and find a time when nation has not been rising against nation. You think about famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. Name a time in the history of man when you did not see these things. No. It, they will deliver you to the tribulation. When's the last time you didn't know about tribulation taking place. The point I'm trying to make is that Jesus is not talking about the end of the world. He's not talking about His second coming right here. But He is letting them know that when you see all of these things happening, then it is a good indication that Jerusalem is going to be destroyed soon. But there's something that Jesus says that is going to happen before Jerusalem and the temple would be destroyed. And it's found in verse 14. We really need to take note of it. Look at what he said. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. So, before Jerusalem is destroyed, before the temple is destroyed, what's going to happen? The gospel is going to be preached. In fact, look at Mark's account. Look at a parallel passage in Mark chapter 13. Hold your hand there. Go to Mark chapter 13 and look at the way that Mark words it. Mark chapter 13 and verse 10. And the gospel must first be, be preached to all the nations. So before this is going to take place, what's going to happen? The gospel is going to be preached to all the nations. Now, hold your hand there and go to Colossians 1 and verse 23 with me. Go to Colossians 1 and verse 23. In Colossians 1.23, Paul would say, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, no, no, don't miss it, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. When Paul wrote this, but first of all, Jesus said, before these things take place, what's going to happen? The gospel is going to be preached throughout all the world. When Paul writes this, incidentally, which was around 60 to 62 AD, what had happened? The gospel had been preached throughout all the world. What do we know is coming? The destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Incidentally, when was Jerusalem destroyed? AD 70, some eight years later. And so when you go back to our text and he talks about the end will come, he's not talking about the second coming of Christ. He's talking about none other than the destruction of Jerusalem. Look at verse 15. 
In verse 15 of our text, it says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken, by, spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. So look at what he does. He makes mention of the desolation of abomination or the abomination of desolation. What is that talking about? Okay. In a parallel passage, Luke chapter 21 and verse 20, let's go and see what Dr. Luke has to say. Luke chapter 21, I want you to look at verse 20. I want you to see this with me. In Luke 21, 20, still in the same context of what Matthew is talking about, what Mark is talking about, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is is near. What army came in and destroyed? And incidentally, the word desolation just literally means destruction. What army came in and destroyed Jerusalem? What army came in and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem? Was it not the Roman army? It was, led by Titus in AD 70. And so when when over here when it talks about the abomination of desolation, and he makes mention of Daniel the prophet. Daniel was one who told about this, that there's going to come a time. Just like Daniel told about all of these other nations that were going to rise and they were going to fall because of their unbelief, because of their rebellion. Likewise, what Jesus is doing right here in this passage, this is really a judgment passage against Jerusalem. Because note if you will that it is described as the holy place. Now, what was the holy place for the Jew? It was the temple. And where was the temple located in verse 15? It was located in no other place than the city of Jerusalem. And how did the people of Jerusalem respond to Jesus? They rejected Him. And as a result, what was going to happen? Judgment was going to be brought upon them. And that judgment was in the form of the destruction of Jerusalem. But just to show you that once again, he is not talking about some futuristic events that are going to take place. Look at verse 16. Don't, don't miss this. Verse 16. After the des abomination of desolation is, is coming, look at what it says in verse 16. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now, now wait a minute. When it comes to the second coming of Christ, where is it going to happen? Just in Judea? No, but rather when you and I think of the second coming of Christ, it is going to be a worldwide event. The earth shall melt with fervent heat. The elements, that's the sun, the moon, the stars, the constellations, you name it, they are all going to be dissolved. They're all going to be completely destroyed. And so what do we learn when we see the word Judea? You've got a location that lets you know that what Jesus is talking about He's talking about a specific region. He's talking about a group of people who lived in the area of Jerusalem and this event was going to take place there. He says, let all those who are in Judea do what? Flee to the mountains. Why? Because the city is going to be destroyed. Let him who, him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of it. Why? Because it's going to come so fast if you linger then you're going to be destroyed. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Why? Why is there a woe to these individuals? Well, can you imagine how difficult it would be running from an army of men and you've got little babies? And so there is a woe there. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Look at that word flight. What does it indicate? It indicates something that you can run from. Brothers and sisters, when Jesus comes back, can we run from it? Can we hide? Is there any place we can go? No. I mean, we saw that in the second coming of Christ. What's going to happen to those who are in the grave? They're going to come forth. What's going to happen to those in the Hadean world? They're going to come forth. What's going to happen to you and I? We are going to be ushered up to God, those of us who are faithful. And so no one can escape it. 
It's an event that no one is going to get away from. There's no place that you and I can hide. But look at these people. They are taking flight. Literally, they are running from something. You cannot run from the second coming of Christ. For then there will be great tribulation. When? When this happens. When Jerusalem is destroyed or when the armies of Rome come against Jerusalem. For then there will be great tribulation. It does not say way off in the future sometime that is yet to come, which many people believe. For then there will be great tribulation. Such has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time, nor ever shall there be. And unless those days were shortened, no place would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. You know what made... Let me back up. Do you know what kept the entire world from being destroyed when Jerusalem was attacked by Rome? It was people just like you. Do you remember when Abraham learned from God that I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? And God says, Abraham says, Lord, what if there's 50 righteous there? And he talks him down to 40, and then 45, and then 30, and then you know, 20. What if there are 10? If there had been 10 righteous souls, to this very day, Sodom and Gomorrah would still be in existence. What is it that kept the entire world from being destroyed? It was those who were righteous. And I know this is a rabbit, a side rabbit that we are hitting here, but the point that you need to see from this, what is it that keeps God from coming back? We often wonder that, don't we? Don't we wonder, we look at this world, and we say how wicked and evil it has become. And folks, this is a fast-moving train, and it's not slowing down. And don't we wonder what's keeping him from coming? Go home and look in the mirror. It's you. Those of us who are righteous. It's for the elect's sake. God doesn't want anyone to perish. And he's giving us the opportunity to teach more and more people. Verse 23, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. How long has that been going on? A long time? Since the time of Jerusalem? Since the destruction of Jerusalem? Still going on today? See, I have told you beforehand, therefore, if they say to you, look, here is the, here in the, look, look, he is in the desert, do not go out, or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. What does He mean by that? Just as sure as you and I can know that the sun is going to rise out of the east and set in the west, what can we depend on? The coming of Jesus. We know the sun is going to rise, don't we? In the morning. That is, the Lord doesn't come back. We know it's going to rise out of the east. You don't have to figure that out. You don't have to get up and say, well, you know, I wonder if it's going to come from the north or the south today. Well, it's always going to come from the east. It's always going to set in the west. And just as sure as you can know that, you can know that Jesus is coming. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Now, in verse 29, a lot of people believe that this is additional teaching concerning the second coming of Christ. But remember... He's still talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the power of heavens will be shaken. What should I immediately gain from this passage, especially after we have studied the book of Revelation on Wednesday night? This is apocalyptic language. An apocalyptic language is language that is seen in the Bible. It's not literal events that are taking place, but it's language representing the depth and the depravity of what's going to take place when certain events do happen in life. But let me show you an, a, an example. Go to Isaiah chapter 13. Go with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 13. <clears throat> now, in Isaiah chapter 13, I want you to begin reading in verse 1 with me. Let's see what's going on. Let's just don't dive right into a passage, but let's look at the very first verse of the verse, uh, very first verse of the chapter, and see what is being discussed. In verse 1, it says, The burden against 
Babylon. What is the word burden? It literally refers to the judgment against Babylon. What is God doing? He is pronouncing a judgment or His judgment against Babylon. In fact, it is described in verse 9. Look at it. Behold, the day of the Lord comes. Now, question. Is this talking about the second coming of Christ? Or is this talking about judgment? Sometimes when you and I see that phrase, the day of the Lord comes, the day of the Lord can be talking about the second coming of Christ. Like in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. But sometimes when we see this word or this phrase, the day of the Lord, it's talking about judgment. The, the judgment of God. Not necessarily the end judgment, but judgment that He brings upon people in this life. So how do we know? We have to look at the context. And we have to see how the writer is using that phrase. And then we pick the definition that best fits there. So what judgment is he talking about? Well, it's a judgment against who? None other than Babylon. What is that judgment going to look like? Verse 9, Cruel with both wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and he will destroy its sinners from it. For, for the stars of heaven, don't miss this, for the stars of heaven and their consolations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth and the moon will not cause its light to shine. Now, literally, is it the very fact that when Babylon fell to the Medes and the Persians, was it the very clear fact and, and, and literal fact that the stars stopped shining? that the moon stopped giving her light, that the sun stopped shining. For the Babylonian world, it was as if their world was coming to an end. It was. But this is not literal. It's talking about how they fell. You and I can understand that. Perhaps we've lost something that was very valuable in this life. Maybe a mother, father, some other loved one. How did you feel when that happened? Be honest. Did you feel as if the stars had fallen from the sky? Did you feel as if the moon had stopped shining? Likewise the sun? You see, when we are experiencing difficult times in life, it feels as if our world is coming to an end. And likewise with Babylon. When the Medes and the Persians came against them, for drop down to verse 17. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them. I drop down to verse 19. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> Can you just think about that? The beauty of Babylon. And you think about when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. What was the severity involved when God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah? It was just smoke. You remember a lot Look back and all he could see was smoke rising up from the area where Sodom and Gomorrah were. Sodom and Gomorrah was so destroyed to the point that even geologists today do not know the exact location. And the Bible says that that's exactly the what. Now here's the apocalyptic language once again. Was Babylon destroyed that bad? No. In fact, Alexander the Great went in and he made the palace there his home. So, but, just think about it. For the Babylonians to be driven out of their country, to not be able to say this is the land of Babylon that we are reigning, how did it make them feel? As if they were destroyed. And so when you and I go back over here and we look at this passage of Scripture in the book of Matthew, this is apocalyptic language to those people who lived in the city of Jerusalem. When the Roman army came in and began to destroy Jerusalem and to tear down the walls and to tear down the most sacred place known to a Jew, temple, how did it make them feel? As if their world had come to an end. Verse 30, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He will send His angels with a great shout, with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds from one end of the earth to 
the other. Now, that sounds very compelling as if there are going to be signs that Jesus is going to come. And that is a passage where people who believe that there are certain signs that are exhibited that you and I can look at and see the coming of Jesus as soon, they will appeal to this verse. But I want you to go back to verse 29 and look at what it says. It says, in those days. Okay? What days? The days when these people were living. The very days when Jesus Himself would say, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. In fact, go to verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, what things once again? He's still talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. He has not changed his discussion. When all of these things know that it is near at the doors. And then verse 20, 34 just puts the cap on it, brothers and sisters. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, when are all of these things that we just read about, when are they going to take place? In that generation. Now, did the second coming of Christ take place in this generation? Folks, it hasn't happened yet. So what do we know that Jesus is still discussing all the way through to verse 35? He's still talking about destruction of Jerusalem. You remember the second question? What is the day of your coming in the end of the world? Verse 36. But of that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Do you see the contrast there, brothers and sisters? Of that day. Which day? The second day that the apostles were talking about. Remember, you've got to go back to verse 4. There are two questions that are being asked. When is Jerusalem and the temple going to be destroyed? And when is it that you're going to come back and the end of the world is going to take place? Jesus says, but of that day. Answering the second question. No one knows. And I think it's very interesting that the Bible plainly says, not even the angels of heaven know, but, but my Father, He is the only one who knows. And then Jesus gives illustrations. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. You think back to the days of Noah and the flood. How did they know the flood was coming? They felt that first raindrop. You know it. It hit them right here. They knew that something was wrong. You with me? It was a surprise to them. And so what did they have to do? They had to be ready. In the same sense, you and I do not know when Jesus is coming. We don't. We've just got to be ready. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be at a time that we do not know, at a time that we do not expect, that we are not looking for. Then two men will be in the field, one taken, the other left. Two will be in the grinding at the mill, one taken, the other left. Watch therefore, here's our attitude, what we should do. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour the Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken in. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You cannot get more plain than that. Brothers and sisters, if the first section of Scripture that we looked at tonight, verse 4 through 35, are teaching that there are signs of the second coming of Christ, then there is a clear contradiction in verse 44. Because Jesus plainly says, and also in verse 36, that day and hour, no one knows. Verse 44, be ready, for you do not know when the Son of Man comes. He's coming. I can count on that. Just as sure as the sun rises out of the east and sets in the west. When? That's something I don't know. So what do you and I need to do? We need to be ready. 
You may be here tonight and you are not a New Testament Christian. In the kindness of my heart, I say that you're not ready. You're not ready to meet Jesus. And you don't want to find yourself in that condition. Come believing that Jesus is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, be baptized for the remission of sins. And you leave here tonight a child of the living God. Won't you do that? I mean, everything is ready. God made this opportunity ready for you. Take advantage of it. Maybe you're here and you're already a child of God. Your life is not right. There's some things that, that maybe you know you need to change in your life because when this day comes, we've been talking about we want to be prepared. We want to be ready. Well, why not take care of that tonight? And you, if you need to respond in any way, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?
Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for this day that you've blessed us with, this, this first day of the week when we've been able to join together and worship you. We're thankful for the good lessons that we've heard and the good prayers that we've heard. Father, we're thankful for the singing, which gives glory to you and encourages each other and teaches us as well. Thank you so much for David and his dedication to the gospel and preaching that and, and helping us better understand it and become better Christians. And Father, we pray that you will help us to do our part, that we will we will study your word on our own and we will always seek to make ourselves better for you and to glorify you and to, to take this message and share it with others. Father, we pray for our good elders here at Lafayette that you will be to each of them. They make decisions that affect our salvation. Father, we know that they watch for our souls and we, we pray that you'll give them wisdom and strength to, to help us. Father, as we leave this place and go into our homes and our, our jobs and work and school and we pray that you will help us to be a shining light for you. May we always seek to, to show the love that you've given us to those around us. Please, Father, strengthen us, forgive us of our sins, and above all, we pray that your will be done in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.